So hi, uh, first I'd like to check the microphone. Is it okay? Okay. So yeah, let's jump into it. So I'd like to tell you about my experience with respect to two things, which are pretty similar, but they are not the same. So the first I'd like to tell you uh, about my impression on uh, uncertainty in machine learning and how to tackle it using tackle it estimation using Bayesian neural networks. So this is the topic of my presentation. So first, let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, so currently, uh, I work for Sigmoidal, which is a, consult a ma machine learning artificial intelligence consult consultancy boutique here in Warsaw. I work there as principal machine learning engineer. And beside that, I also work in the uh, student scientific group, which is called Tensor Traffic. We use Bayesian machine learning there. So uh, this is one of the sources of my thoughts here. Beside of that, uh, I currently work for over three years in business and over uh, one and a half year, uh, I use Bayesian deep learning. So this is like the, my base, which I'd like to share today. Okay. So let me briefly outline what I would like to uh, tell you about today. So first I will start from uncertainties. So I will show you examples and how they differ because there is no, uh, not single uncertainty, but there are different kinds of them. Then I will briefly show you the basics of Bayesian machine learning. Uh, then we'll gentle, gently dive into uh, Bayesian deep learning and uh, at the end, I will share you something interesting from me, for you, which uh, I found I found it recently, and I think this is really really interesting because this shows somehow that machine learning actually just fills the cycle in some way, and it's also connected to Bayesian deep learning. Okay, so let's start. Uh, how many of you have heard about this issue that the Apple Face ID used uh, since the iPhone X? was hacked. Yeah. So this was really popular uh, issue, uh, which showed that actually we can hack machine learning and there is always an interesting risk in machine learning. Uh, in, if you consider this case, uh, from my perspective, it's not the algorithm to blame. If you build better algorithm, there will certainly will be people who will try to hack them. And it's almost impossible that in as time goes to infinity, that no one will hack this algorithm. So there is always a risk uh, in machine learning. And this is also might be considered as kind of uncertainty. So this is the first case of uncertainty, which I'd like to cover. The second thing is a little bit different. How many of you have heard about this case? Yeah, this is really funny, actually. Maybe off the rails a little bit, but... So the situation look, looks the following. So actually, Microsoft Research released a Twitter bot where they... will uh, taught the bot to respond to the Twitter and obviously they online trained them uh, during the conversation and after <laughs> some time someone realized that this bot actually really get off the rails and started to uh, started being really nasty so I think this is completely different kind of risk and uncertainty than the preview one here actually what happened is that the model went of the experience which uh, researchers uh, taught him on, right? So it was introduced by obviously malicious but new data and this new data completely switched the model. So it turned out that there, wa there were uh, kinds of data for which this model uh, wasn't robust to at, in the first place. Okay, so let's wrap this up. So we have two kinds of uncertainties, right? So here, so let's have a look at this graph. So what do we have here? So imagine that you have ideal classifier, right? So this classifier discriminates between cats and dogs. And this is ideal one. You cannot build better one based on, for example, images. So the uh, orange, uh, orange line is the score for, cat, for dogs and the blue one is for cats and the green one is the sum of these lines. So obviously you will always have a risk, right? Even in case of the best classif classification, there, is, there will always be a region which will be hard to classify. And there is second kind of error where you don't have, uh, simply you don't have enough data, but you can have more, 
right? If, and if you have more data, so for example, if uh, the researchers which were developing the bot knew about this malicious attack, they could tackle it. So it's so here, this is something which based on our data we cannot tackle, and this is what we call a risk or aleatoric error. And we have something which is called epistemic error, which can be tackled in case of, uh, well, if we get more data, right? Okay, so this is the, the, this part uh, where we talk about uncertainties and why the next part is about Bayesian deep learning, because nowadays Bayesian deep learning is one of the uh, most um, important, most widely used techniques in order to assess as different kinds of uncertainties in uh, deep learning. So this now, obviously there are other met methods. I will briefly cover them at the end of my presentation, but now let's dive into Bayesian machine learning. <coughs> okay, so before we get into it, I would like to show you a comparison between classical machine learning and Bayesian machine learning. Uh, I did it in the form of points where we compare different stage of trainings uh, in both of these approaches and it's slightly adjusted to neural nets. So it's not like the general machine learning but it's slightly adjusted to neural networks. So in the classical machine learning when you train your network, you have, we call it topology, right? We have something to which we feed data and we get the model. It's like the, it consists of model architecture, model weights, etc. So at the beginning we have a set of all possible models. Whereas in Bayesian machine learning we have something more because beside this set we have a distribution over, over these models. So we can say, okay, this model is more likely than this one, right? So this is the first difference and this, uh, this probability distribution is often called prior. Uh, when it comes to optimization, usually we'd like to build a model and most of the current deep learning models might be expressed in these terms where we maximize the likelihood of data, right? So we take a model and we choose a single model which will maximize with respect to what we'd like to optimize it. Whereas in Bayesian uh, machine learning, we we are not training a single model, but we are changing the distribution, right? We'd like to, uh, this new distribution, which occurs during the optimization process, to like um, be more likely to produce our data in some sense. So this is the second change, and this is also covered in the f uh, second point, so actually the third, where here we have usually a deterministic function, so we have a single function, whereas here, we have once again model distribution. So it's this, from this sense, this is completely different. What it's really worthy to state here that usually we cannot tackle this distribution. So in some sense, we are approximating this distribution using samples, a set of samples, which we can produce from this distribution. And during the inference, if we have a function, we are calling the function. If we have a distribution and we'd like to have an inference, we need to average this distribution out in some sense. So these are the differences, right? And where the uncertainty comes from? From two, uh, actually, point, points two and three actually shows where we can uh, assess what is the uncertainty of our distribution of models. Because if this distribution has like huge variance, then one may assume that we are pretty uncertain about our answers, right? And if the, or for example, if the inference, when we average out the distribution varies and have huge variance, this is also the implication that we, we cannot be probably 100% sure about the inference of our model. So obviously these two things are somehow uh, similar. So basically if you have this, the same models, we have the same inferences, whereas the opposite usually uh, doesn't hold because we, can, we could have similar inferences uh, made by different, different, different models. And actually this uh, uncertainty in parameters, because this is how it's actually uh, called, it's harder to assess because of the fact that it's very often intractable. So usually we'll stick to this inference uh, distribution, uh, the predictive distribution, and we'll simply check whether this predictive distribution is pretty certain or not. So during the, the rest of the presentation, I will assume that we'll rather refer to the uh, inference distribution. Okay, so here's an example. So uh, this is an example of linear regression 
Uh, and here we, you have a track of uh, classical machine learning. Here you have track of Bayesian machine learning. So in case of uh, Bayesian, you have a prior here. So the problem which we are solving here is linear regression with two parameters, W1 and W2. And here you can see samples from the, uh, uh, because we can sample the models, right? So here the models are lines. So uh, here you may see the sample from the distribution. So the a priori, if we have only prior, uh, as you may see here, the, 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 this prior here is a Gaussian one. So we assume that our parameters comes from a zero center Gaussian. And uh, what's worth to know, what worth to notice at this stage that here you have like uh, plus signs here, and this is like the original distribution, the, tr the grand truth distribution. And as you may see here, th when the new data arrives, actually the, uh, this, we, we, we can see that this new uh, distribution of parameters is actualized, uh, and we have like, and it's more and more certain in this case. Whereas in case of classical machine learning, due to different invariances in uh, parameters, the situation still like you have a huge region of uh, valid models which uh, highly differs from uh, from the um, grand truth one. So this example, which I took from Christopher Bishop's book, shows you somehow why one may be interested in using uh, Bayesian learning. Okay, so this is how it looks like from machine learning point of view, but obviously we'd like to tell about the deep learning and uh, deep learning inference. So uh, I will make a, a maybe short, let me introduce my approach to this part. So what I wanted to achieve here by presenting this part. I will not use any equations. I want simply to share with you my thoughts and intuitions, which I found extremely useful when I was reading these papers about Bayesian machine learning. And I'd like to show you how I usually approach these new methods and what I think makes them much easier to understand and implement. So that's why, for example, in something which is called the variational lower bound, which if, how, how many of you uh, is familiar with this, with this concept? Yeah, it's really hard one from the mathe mathematical perspective. So I'd like to share like simplified intuition behind this. So when you will, once you would read the paper, once you read the paper, you will understand steps uh, which are happening there. So in case of neural networks, uh, even shallow one, it's not the case that only, the, the only deep neural networks are hard, but obviously the deeper one, the harder the problem is. We have something uh, due to the like many nonlinearities which occur in uh, the inference of neural network. This makes the like computing the closed form of this posterior like we had here almost impossible. And it's really, really hard. Uh, just to give you an example, before the deep learning uh, era, when we, so for example, in Christopher Bishop's book, there is an example of how to, how one can apply Bayesian methods to, to neural nets, not deep learning. So there are eight really harsh assumptions made in order to make it happen. So it's really, really hard, right? And there is a sing single trick which makes it a little bit easier. And I'd like to introduce with this trick, which is called the variational lower bound. So what's happening here is that, okay, we have neural network models. So we have the, the distribution of models. And it's obviously once the data arrives, it's impossible to compute the posterior of this data. So what one can do? So first of all, one can introduce the second distribution called Q here, which is easy to sample. We can easily get samples from this distribution. So we can take this distribution and sample, let's say, 100 different models from it and have, have these particular realizations uh, in order to, for example, train them. And during the training, we are doing two things. So first of all, we'd like to have, have, have this queue uh, penalized for uh, differing from prior. So we would like to say, okay, I'd like you to produce similar models as I am. So we, when I, I'm, by, by I, am, I mean prior. But on the other hand, on these samples, which are relatively easy to sample, we'd like to uh, perform the original training. So this is as simple as that. We have two steps here. So first of all, we are sampling models. 
we can do this per training, per batch. Usually multiple approaches are taken. And then we'd like to, once this model is trained, we'd like to make these parameters not to differ from prior a lot. So as you may see, and many papers are actually following, which uses variational lower bound, actually follows this uh, idea. And I will show you later how this looks like. And during the inference, OK, once again, we can sample these models. So during the inference, once the training is finished, we can sample from the distribution queue and have a sample from this distribution. And we can approximate different statistical measures in order to perform prediction, uncertainty estimation, et cetera. So as you may see here, uh, it's rather predictions of these sampled models valid because of the fact that usually the parameters of neural nets are so complicated and have so many multiple invariances that it's hard to say that, okay, these different models are uh, totally different. Okay, so how one can think about this variational lower bound? I'd like to think about this as a uh, projection. We have posterior distribution and we have a subspace of easy to compute and easy to sample distributions. So we are projecting our posterior distribution on this simple one. Okay, so let me give you a few examples of how this works. So first of all, uh, we have, it's one of the simplest and it's, but on the other hand, it's really popular. So how many of you have heard about dropout? Okay, so for, for the rest, the dropout is a technique where during the training you are, uh, with each of these units, you have assigned the probability and you independ independently uh, turn off these units with respect to this probability. So for example, if this unit had probability of 0 0.3, uh, in, uh, in 10 different runs of this uh, algorithm, uh, it will be probably something like third times turned off during the inference, or during the training. And variational dropout comes from the fact that you keep this procedure going during the inference phase, so you can sample multiple models from it. So this is, I think, one of the simplest uh, examples of the variational training. So how this looks like? So first of all, we have like two popular kinds of methods here. So first of all is vanilla one, where we have a fixed, for each unit we have a fixed dropout rate f during the whole training and inference. So as you may see here, uh, this distribution uh, doesn't change, so we don't penalize it because it's, it's constant. And it actually produces pretty good results, but for the risk only. And there is actually, I came across a really interesting and simple explanation why this happens. So because the distribution, this distribution of this uh, turning of the units probabilities doesn't change. Uh, if you, for example, so one, one expects that if it doubles the uh, data set, the, the, your, the model should be more certain with respect to the epistemic uncertainty. But one, if this, if this doesn't change, if we double the, our data set, it's almost equivalent to train your network for twice as many epochs as the original one. So this is a simple explanation why this assess only risk, not the uh, as, uh, epistemic uncertainty. So in order to tackle that, one can use concrete dropout when this dropout rate is actually learnable, but beware that this might be hard and unstable, unstable in training. On the other hand, it's really, really interesting technique. So here you may see example. So we'd like to uh, train a model based on simple function, like when you have a sim single argument and single output. So as you may see here, this is the technique which I will cover later. And it, it shows that, for example, OK, we have 10 points. So we are pretty uncertain what happens outside the dis where, the, where we don't have points. But once we have more points, we are more and more certain. But in case of dropout, as you may see, so this uh, re area here, I think it's, this is the plot of the confidence intervals with respect to, to the score. So as you may see here, once the more, of, um, more if the more point, more more points arrives, uh, arrive, the uncertainty estimation, the, our our um, uncertainty estimate doesn't change. So that's why I truly advise you to use the vanilla dropout only for the risk assessment. Uh, the second technique, which is also which I also found relatively simple but also interesting, uh, is a technique which is called bias by backprop. It's not a single technique. Even in, in this paper, 
where you have it's implemented. You have multiple versions of models there, but I will stick myself to the simplest one. So this technique is actually comes from the family, uh, which is widely used of, of these uh, Bayesian deep learning models, which use something which is called latent Gaussian variables and how this works. So let me show you on a simple example. So we'd like to have distribution of our weights, not single set of weights. So how can we uh, get the uh, distribution of our weights instead of single weights? So we can treat a single weight here as a sum of normally distributed random variable uh, co multiplied by the positive factor here. Actually, this is the variance, right? So uh, of this uh, distribution, which is learnable because this parameter is learnable, plus the mean of this distribution. So as you may see here, these latent Gaussian variables are these ones, and we treat and we simply we are simply sampling during the inference time. We are sampling this this uh, realization of the random variable independently for each weight, and then we, trans we transform using these learnable parameters, and that's how we obtain the distribution of our of our single weight. Uh, so there are a few problems with this because once again, it's rather believed to be good at propagation of risk. And why is that? So first of all, all of these variables are independent, right? And they are also independent of target. And this is crucial because let's consider a single model where we have a target Y, which is normal random variable with mean with some mean and with some variance, and we have a random variable x by which we'd like to approximate this target one. So if you think about it closely, uh, if you want this approximation to be good with respect to, for example, the mean squared error, you'd like, you'd like the difference of these two distributions to have zero mean and small variance, right? But this equals, because of, this fact, because of the fact that these variables are independent, this makes your trainable distribution here to set the variance to zero because if because of the independence because if this trainable distribution have positive variance it will add its variance to the prediction and will increase the variance so that's why this is like brief explanation uh, why these methods actually doesn't propagate uncertainties during the training it rather propagates the risk because this if if the the prediction change uh, this means that these changes actually change something. So uh, this was a region which was uncertain, but it was rather uncertain because of the fact that m different, uh, different predictions came from the same argument. And that's why this distribution was uncertain, not the fact that these points were unknown to distribution, as I show in the, the, the preview graph. So this is the explanation why these methods might, might fail. And actually, the, they are failing, which uh, for example, deep mind researchers notice in their work on reinforcement learning. So it's not like the, the, this, this is rather a simple explanation of empirical fact w which was observed rather than a mathematical explanation which is, which is abstract. Okay. So these were met methods which were using uh, latent Gaussian variables. So at, in the end, I'd like to show you something really fresh, really new. This came from paper. Uh, this was introduced by paper, which I already stated here, randomized per functions for deep reinforcement learning. This paper was published in, in June this year. And I really like it because, first of all, it's proved that it's really good. And on the other hand, I think this is a model which someone could came up with like 10 years ago because it uses like old style methods. So actually how this method works. So first of all, it's really good because it can make uh, Bayesian uh, any neural network if you have it trained. And what is good, it's for regression. Most of these methods which I presented, they're rather good for classification. This method is rather good for regression. As I, ca as I said, this came from uh, DeepMind, which is interested in, estimate, in estimation of reward, which is continuous. So you take the model and you take the k copies of this model. By, by, by copies, I mean the same architecture, but random weights. Then you sum, for each of these models, you subset or you bootstrap 
a subset of your original data set. For each of these subsets, you perturb the target using the uh, Gaussian noise. And then for each of these copies of the original model, you train it to predict the difference between the perturbed uh, target and the original model. And during the inference, one may treat, uh, you take the original model, take each of the assembled models, you add them because as you may see, then these will cancel out. And you can treat these as samples from the posterior. And for some reason, this works really well. Actually, it's called Bayesian because this pro procedure is equivalent to Bayesian, uh, to Bayesian one in case of linear regression. So it's not strictly Bayesian, but this is the rationale provided. And it works really well. And if you are familiar with methods like, which were popular like 10, 15 years ago, I think this is one. This could be easily um, developed during this time. So in some sense, in, the, in case of Bayesian uh, deep learning, the machine learning made the full cycle. And we are coming back to good old methods like bootstrap, uh, target perturbation, etc. I found this really, really interesting. OK, so this was the last part. Uh, just to show you how this, why, how this works. So uh, here is this method where you have this prior network and bootstrap. As you may see, so this is a really interesting example. So here you have, uh, so the data set consists of a set of, con a set of points with constant value and one additional one, uh, one point with diff totally different value. And one may think whether this come from bias or this came from like new trend, which is not observed yet. So as you may see the classical assemble uh, which was trained on the full data, it's not, doesn't capture the, the uncertainty. Uh, sim s the same happens for single ensemble and prior network. But in case of bootstrap, there were models which, uh, which, which haven't uh, captured this point. And as you may see, the bootstrapping and the prior network actually makes these predictions uh, to be more uncertain, which matches our expectation that we don't know what will happen here. So we'd like to check. We don't know whether these points actually start new trend, for example, the constant one, or this is a simple, simple bias. So as you may see, this is an example of how this method works. Like just the final slide, because I haven't covered everything, because in 30 minutes, it's hard to do this in 30 minutes. So if you are, were interested in that, so here, these two methods are um, like state-of-the-art methods, like really, really hard. Actually, this one is really hard to understand, but it's, it's really, it's really powerful. And this one is also came from DeepMind. These use variational uh, lower bound method, uh, method. This one is also really interesting because one may tackle the, ass the assessing uncertainty as checking whether the active inner activation of network is known. So for example, one, we can take the inner activation on training set. We can build some kind of density model and check whether the new point actually matches this distribution. So here you may find the paper which shows this approach. This approach, actually I put this paper, this is a pretty new, uh, pretty new approach. And it's, I think, slowly emerging on, uh, on this, like, this set of ideas. Because all of these methods, they need either multiple training, multiple inferences. So the methods, for example, my method, which actually needs a single forward pass, are getting more and more popular because of the speed issue. And if you want to see the implementations of like these two methods, you can go to uh, this GitHub repository. And uh, I think something like a month ago, I gave uh, similar speech, but I concentrated mostly on uncertainty. So if you want to see, get know more about uncertainty and how to tackle it in a simple way, you can go here where you have all of materials from my preview talk. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. We have a space for one question. No questions? Oh, there's one. Sorry. Just light. God damn it. You mentioned basically uh, new models uh, for, ba for training uh, neural networks which incorporate some uh, Bayesian inference. Uh, but are there any uh, advances in uh, efficient sampling techniques that uh, come useful to, uh, today, or is it mostly from uh, designing uh, new models? Mm, actually, uh, these, two met these two methods here, 
they're actually uh, they're rather increasing the complexity of something than um, the model one, the models one. So, so you can take actu uh, actually almost every any model, uh, any neural network model, and you can uh, change this model by introducing like mo uh, really complex sampling using these techniques. So these techniques are actually rather about sampling than about the neural network architectures or models. Thank you so much. Great applause, Martin.